Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. The Big Three is the Big Three again. We are going to have a bighorn sheep season in 2016. My guest this week is Brett Weedman. Brett is the bighorn sheep biologist for Game and Fish. Brett, first off today, let's uh, give the viewers some background about the bighorns in North Dakota. Well, they were extirpated from the state in uh, 1905 is when there was the last known uh, native bighorn sheep uh, seen. And then the uh, Game and Fish Department, uh, North Dakota Game and Fish Department went to British Columbia, captured 18 bighorns in 1956, and reintroduced bighorn sheep at that time, put them in a, a, an enclosure, 200 acre enclosure near Magpie Creek in the Badlands. Uh, in the 60s, that population began to grow and began to release now free ranging bighorns in the, primarily in the southern Badlands, south of Medora and done subsequent uh, translocations from Idaho, Oregon, British Columbia again, and then uh, most recently uh, from Montana. The first hunting season was held in 1975, and they've had them every year up till now, except for four years. So we've had quite a few uh, hunting seasons. We've harvested about 240 bighorn rams since 1975. The herd has had its ups and downs over the year, like you said, some translocations and things like that, but uh, what, four or five years ago, I had a terrible setback. Yeah, we had a die-off actually in the late 90s in the southern Badlands, which was well publicized, where we lost a lot, probably about 100 bighorns uh, in the late 90s. Uh, since 1956 in the northern Badlands, we had never had a disease event, no pneumonia, no setbacks of that sort. Uh, population done really well, it was growing rapidly. So in 2014, when I was doing the summer population survey, we were really on pace to you know, shatter our, st our record count. I mean, we had lots of bighorns. Uh, they were doing great. We had just brought sheep in from Alberta as well that year. And yeah, then in August, we, I did a flight and had six mortality signals from radio callers. And you know at that point there's something <laughs> bad going on. And then we, of course, we'd go in and hike into those dead animals and do necropsies and discover that we had bacteria and ammonia in the population. And it was pretty severe that first year, 2014. We brought in 24 bighorns from Alberta uh, and all died except for two. So they got hit really hard. So first we thought it was isolated to the Alberta bighorns. And then we, as we kind of ventured out, we realized that the die-off probably started south of there, moved north up to Little Missouri, and, and we began losing quite a few of our resident uh, animals as well. But obviously we had to cancel the season because of the die-off, but the, uh, yeah. herd, the herd is rebounding nicely, apparently. Right, so when you have these pneumonia die-offs, related die-offs, are they happen across the West. Every state and even some of the provinces have dealt with this. And what the common theme is you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Are you going to lose 90%? Are you going to lose 50%? Are you going to lose 20%? You just don't know. And in 2014, we were losing them at such a significant rate that we thought we don't want to issue bighorn licenses in 2015 and say we lose you know, a 75, 80%, we got a bunch of sick sheep out there and, and you got hunters. So we had to take a year and step back to really assess the status of uh, the population. What are the impacts gonna be of the initial wave of the, of the pneumonia? And fortunately in 2015, our counts came in much better than what we were expecting and found a decent number of mature rams at that time. And so that, that point then after the 2015 survey, we began the process of potentially reopening hunting in 2016. Is there a chance that the pneumonia could come back? Yes. Uh, no, that was one of our concerns, the reopening of the season. These pneumonia events, you know, out west, there's been populations that have had a die off, they've recovered quite nicely, and then they crash again. You don't know when that's going to happen. The pathogens are still in the population. These, these, uh, these bacterial uh, organisms that cause the pneumonia, they're still within all of our herds right now. And we're still losing bighorns at a much slower rate, but we're still losing bighorns in pneumonia mm -hmm. even now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to look at how we open the season and kind of guard against if we have another major uh, die off when they usually occur in summer. So we, you know, so we thought we don't, we, historically we would issue the number of tags, set the number of tags in February and the, pro, the proclamation would be signed in March, and then we do the drawing like in April. Well, we thought, okay, we don't want to issue, say, six tags, whatever, in March, it. and then we have a major die-off in the summer. So we made a few changes to uh, the, the protocol for 2016. 
Well, let's talk about the 2016 season. Yeah, so I just finished the summer survey a um, couple days ago. And relating to the hunting, uh, what we've decided to do is we set a range of license numbers in, in uh, March. So the proclamation uh, went out in March, two to eight tags. And then Hunter still applied for a bighorn tag with moose and elk, the big three. However, we were not going to set the license numbers until September 1st after the summer population survey. That way we could see what's on the ground, what do we have, and, and, and issue really the, the maximum tags we could while still guarding against a, a die-off. So I finished the, the survey. We actually had a record count of rams. The, the, it was the highest count on record. And what I typically do is we'll issue 8% licenses of total number of rams or 15% of three-quarter curl rams. So we classify these rams as well. And ran those numbers and it came out at uh, eight tags total. And we now we already auctioned the uh, auction license at the Midwest chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation last March. And that hunter was told that the auction hunter, you might win the auction. It could be a high bid around the auction tag, but we might close the season. At that point, then the Sheep Foundation held that those funds until the season was officially declared. So he, he could have potentially just had refunded his money if we had to close the season. So total of eight tags, one auction tag, and then seven lottery licenses. Eight licenses sounds like an awful lot, but you do have good biological reasons for issuing that many licenses. Right, we haven't had eight tags since 1998, so it's been a while. Um, when you have these pathogens in the, in the population, uh, when, and our numbers are good, we're gonna, you know, our numbers are decent, you don't want to get restrictive on harvest of males. Sometimes you want to get more liberal on your harvest of males. Mm -hmm. So one reason was, we just looked at it from a, a hunting standpoint. If we have the mature rams to hunt, let's hunt them. Let's allow hunters that opportunity to harvest those rams. Use them or lose them. Use them or lose them. We don't want them to die of pneumonia. And, and they're, they're healthy, they're big. We've got a lot of roly-poly rams out there, so they're in good shape. <laughs> And secondly, rams can be the, the vector that spreads these pathogens. We do have some herds that have, we have not discovered these pathogens in a few of the populations that are northeast of the north unit of the park. And so rams wander around during the rut, and then they can potentially spread these pathogens into unaffected uh, herds. So what you want to do is kind of bring the, that male-female ratio to a more manageable level where rams kind of stay home during the rut as much as possible. You can't prevent it totally, but you don't want you know, one-to-one -one ratio. Then you got rams, you know, running all over the place during the rut looking for, typically young rams looking for females. Sure. Lottery's going to run shortly. Then what happens? So the lottery, actually, it just ran. I have the, the list in my office. And what I will do is we've, we've drawn those tags, and I will call each hunter in order that they were drawn. And then we have uh, two licenses in unit B1, two licenses in unit B3, three licenses in unit B4. And then I will uh, ask each hunter what unit they might prefer based on, you know, habitat type, you know, the numbers of rams, that sort of thing. And then they will select the unit that they want to hunt in. Uh, they do have the option of rejecting the tag. If they've already planned an elk hunt somewhere or something like that, they can reject uh, their license and then we'll go to the next person. But you just go back in the lottery. You're not, you're not assured of a license in the future. So I think we're going to have uh, some pretty happy people here in a few hours when I start making these phone calls. All right, Brett, thanks. Hunting seasons are in full swing in North Dakota. Archery seasons for deer and pronghorn are both open as well as the season on morning doves. Grouse and partridge seasons are set for opening Saturday, September 10th. The early resident waterfall season opens September 24th and the regular waterfall season is set for an opening on Saturday, October 1st. Pheasant and fall turkey seasons open October 8th and the 2016 Firearms Deer Season opens at noon on Friday, November 4th. For Brett Weedman and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.